back on time, and a quorum of the well, maybe a quorum of the board is present. Yes, a quorum of the board is present. And the State Board of Education meeting of February 11 is called to order. Um, we're going to go right, because we have so many guests today uh, for public participation, we're going to go straight to that. And I know other guests are here for a very important resolution later, a little bit later in our meeting. But uh, so, Mertz, if you would, would start with our public participation. Yes, I will remind people, um, some of who are, whom are aware and some um, people, this is new information, you will be given five minutes for public comment. The board does not engage in a conversation, but you're um, welcomed and they're happy to hear whatever you would like to say. You will sit at the end of the table um, and I will let you know who's next um, as well as who's seated at the table. If you've got handouts, um, if you just want to give them to the nearest board member, they can just pass them around the table. Um, so we'll get started. Um, Bethany Rail, Liz Bauer, Petra Stanley, and Tashana Childress are the first group of speakers. And ladies and gentlemen, for those who don't know, our former esteemed, esteemed state board member, Liz Bauer, is here. Okay. Thank you. And Sandra York, you're going to be next. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm Bethany Rail. I'm a member of the Network of Michigan Educators and the Regional Executive for Way Widening Advancements for Youth. In 2002, I earned national board certification, and since that time, since 2003, I've been an active member of the Network of Michigan Educators, and I'm here on behalf of the network today to talk a little bit about a program that I'm involved in, in our Sharing Success program, which is WAY. WAY is a Michigan nonprofit organization that partners with local school districts and ISDs to provide a blended model of standards-focused project-based learning to middle and high school aged youth. In addition to this, WAY also develops um, online courses that are project-based, iBooks for teachers and students. Um, we do professional development with teachers across the state and nationally of, around differentiated instruction and project-based learning. We've developed a robust standards-focused learning management system and we also act as the ESP for the Way Academy. Joining me today is Liz Bauer, board president of Way Academy of Detroit, as well as um, Petra Stanley, that's okay, Petra, who is a current student at the Way Academy, and Tyshawna Childress, who is a recent graduate of the Way Academy, who'd like to share with you. Okay, I'm just going to say hello again, everybody. Glad to be back here. As, as Bethany said, I'm president of the Way Academy, and we're a public school academy in Detroit, uh, chartered by Lake Superior State University. And uh, Bethany's told you a little bit about it, but when we formed the board, we chose Way Program Incorporated, a nonprofit, as our provi the provider of educational services because. We write the instructional model and the way it works for most gifted students on their way to graduation and for those that take, need more time and more accommodations. So it's really very individualized to the, uh, to the uh, researcher, which is what the term for our students. Um, we have a location in Southwest Detroit that was our first, opened in August of 2012. And then last August, uh, another location in the Brightmoor section of Detroit. And we have about 500 students now between the two uh, various locations. It's year-round, project-based, student-driven, standards-focused, blended learning, got all those things. And graduation is the expected outcome for all. We've had already three graduation ceremonies. <laughs> and so I know some of you visited the one or another of the lab sites. We appreciate your interest. And I want to, before I hand it off to Petra, say thanks to Superintendent Flanagan for the waivers that allow us to have a seat time waiver, a blended learning waiver, a year-round waiver, so that we can just be in school every day, all day long, 24-7. <laughs> Petra, go ahead. Hello. My name is Petra Stanley, and I'm a ninth grade at Way Academy, Detroit. I was homeschooled up until halfway through fourth grade, and Way was the first school I've gone to that I wasn't bullied. The staff is nice and helpful, and I'm good friends with most of them. You guys are a lot more intimidating up close. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, believe I'm getting a, I believe I'm getting a good education, and I'm paying attention a lot in my classes, which is new. And the projects we do are fun and full of learning. Our dual enrollment program helps prepare students for the future. My sister is taking classes at University of Michigan Dearborn while she finishes her high school diploma. I personally would like to do this when I'm old enough. 
I... Ah. <laughs> Oh, whatever. You're doing great. <laughs> Be yourself. You're, You're doing great, Petra. Really <laughs> um, Way is also taking part in robotics this year. This allows students to get an experience for high paying jobs using technology. I am thankful for Way for giving me the opportunities and support I need. Okay. Thanks, Petra. Hi, I'm Tyshana. Um, I am a recent graduate at Way. Um, my experience at Way was a very great one because when I first enrolled, I was going through a lot of health issues and no other school could accommodate me at the time, so they actually accommodated me. Um, the skills I learned from being there was time management, taking responsibility for my actions and my work, and also uh, discipline. Um, uh, I graduated with a 3.8 GPA, and I am recently going to be studying criminal justice at Henry Ford Community College. Um, right now, my role at Way, I was also brought back as an employee with Way. So right now my role with Way is to help the students now get where they need to be to graduate. I also bring a lot of community-based organizations into the school to give the students their opportunities to help inside of the community. And um, I help most of their seniors pretty much get where they need to be regarding college and those types of things. So on behalf of the network, we just wanted to say thank you for allowing us to come and talk today and, and speak with you. Thank you very much. Thank pleasure. you. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Sandra York, and she will be followed by Michael Sampson. Good afternoon. I'm Sandra York, Executive Director for the Michigan Parent Teacher Association, Michigan PTA. Um, and I'm really here for just a little bit of show and tell, I suppose. Uh, we just recently published the Parents Guide to Assessments and Accountability, which is a partner to the Parents Guides to Student Success that came out about a year ago to help parents understand the transition to the Common Core State Standards. The assessment guide is specifically for Michigan. And as this was being put together through National PTA, uh, Joseph and the department here were consulted for some information to make sure we were headed in the right direction. It is not necessarily a uh, cap on top of Smarter Balanced, although that is where we're at. And PTA is supporting that we move forward in that direction um, if at some point there's a reason for the assessments to go in a di different direction. We accept that, but we are, we're in where we are right now, and we think it's incredibly important for parents to be able to get, uh, become grounded in what's going to be happening, not the day before it comes in the door. So these are a couple of tools available to um, parents, all parents, not just PTA members. There are links, well, the assessment guide will be on our website in a day or two, as soon as I'm back in the office. And uh, the parent guides have been out. The difference here, I think uh, sometime last year, I brought you the individual um, guides. This is actually a booklet that contains all of the guides uh, from K th through high school. And to me, well, this is such an incredible resource. It has an area that talks about what the students should be learning at that grade level. Um, there are even uh, things parents can do with children, uh, questions that could be asked of educators. Um, and I, I think about what if this booklet was put in the hand of every parent that has children in Michigan schools? Uh, you wouldn't even need to give it to every child because sometimes there's multiple um, children or student, you know, students in one family and they're not even, um, it's not changing, at least you know, basically what's going on with the Common Core. So I, th I think about the fact that there are some districts that have already taken the grade level ones, photocopied them or printed them, whatever they decided to do and handed them out at, at parent-teacher conferences as a tool to work together. And clearly we need a better stronger, vibrant working relationships uh, between parents and educators in order to allow every child to succeed in Michigan, in this country, really in the world when you get right down to it. Um, I hope these tools will be utilized freely. Um, they may be printed and copied 
in their totality, so to speak, freely. We don't really want people cutting and pasting and turning it into something that maybe it wasn't in the beginning. So um, just wanted to make you aware of that resource. And I know that um, we will, within a, a grant that we have, we will be able to send the assessment guide out to all of the superintendents uh, as well as ISDs and charter schools um, at that level. And, and unfortunately, at when we were at the Education Alliance meeting yesterday, we don't have the funds to mail these out to every principal, but Superintendent Flanagan ha is helping us get that out via email, and I hadn't even taken that next step yet. Um, so I, I really hope that this is a step for us to do better by making that connection between parents and the schools when it comes to the standards. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Michael Sampson, followed by Connie Crittenden. Good afternoon, board. Thanks for the opportunity to address you today. Um, I'm Michael Sampson. I am the president of the Michigan Science Teachers Association. And I would like to take this opportunity to extend an invitation to the board and Mr. Flanagan to attend our conference next month. <laughs> We're meeting in Lansing, March 6th, 7th, and 8th. And uh, we have our exhibit floor open to the public that uh, Thursday evening. And our <laughs> regular sessions are Friday and Saturday. Um, it'll give you guys an opportunity to maybe get some inside look at the next generation science standards and to talk to some of our members and see how they feel about the standards as well. That's all I have to say for you guys. Um, thanks for taking the time to hear me. Very much. It's, uh, it's a Lansing Center and the Radisson. Okay. okay. <laughs> Wait, would you mind leaving information that we can... I will send you guys an email. Thank you, and then we'll pass it on to the board Great. for thank how you. to... Involve. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your dedication also. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, Connie Crittenden, followed by Michael Gallagher. And I, I hope that I see you all at the MSA <coughs> conference. Good afternoon. I'm Connie Crittenden. Um, I'm a classroom teacher in Williamston, uh, the Williamston Community Schools, and this is just my 41st year teaching. Um, I'm here to offer a classroom teacher's perspective on the next generation science standards. I have a background in science and math, a master's in fisheries and wildlife. I um, am a McCullough Fellow and a 1998 presidential um, awardee for excellence in elementary science education. Um, I also serve on the regional, as a regional director for the Michigan Science Teachers Association, and I'm also currently serving on the National Science Teachers Association uh, Committee for Preschool Elementary Science. So, as, and I've also been on the writing team for the, what we now call the GLICs, our um, Gradable Content Expectations in Science here for the State of Michigan. So I hope that from this snapshot of myself that you see that I not only have a pretty high interest in science, but I also have a real stake in science education for Michigan and on a national level. My most recent, uh, recently my science teaching has sort of evolved to include more of the engineering practices from the next generation science standards. And uh, it's, it's sort of a critical part and it's really been an amazing uh, transformation with the kids and with my classroom. For example, my fifth grade students now take on engineering design challenges along with our investigations in science. And they work on solving a problem like building a structure for a specific reason, um, bridges. They've designed a number of different things using specific materials mm, like pasta and marshmallows and newspaper and variety things of that sort. Uh, they also design a solution that's going to meet that problem. They test it. They modify it. Uh, they work with team members and collaborate. They test again. They redesign. Um, and they have to analyze their data until they come up with a result that they think is something they want to present to the whole group. My students not only have the ability to articulate the features of um, their particular solution, but they have to express their ideas clearly in speaking, listening, and writing, which are all part of the Common Core um, English Language Arts um, standards um, when they give presentations. Students also have to dialogue and collaborate with the other design teams. They put together an argument that supports their finding, which is one of the things that's not only in the new uh, Next Generation Science Standards, but also in lingu English Language Arts and also in Mathematics core curriculum, where um, students have to be able to um, present a feasible um, argument on the things that they've, they've designed. Um, and so if this sounds like a real world, world application, it certainly is. Uh, the inclusion of the engineering design and the next generation science standards has uh, profound implications, I think, for our curriculum, our teaching, and the way we assess students. Uh, I strongly feel that all students need opportunities to acquire engineering design practices and concepts along with the practices and concepts of science. 
And so with that in mind, I'd just like to strongly encourage the board to move swiftly in adopting the next generation science standards for the state of Michigan. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Con. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Gallagher, followed by Lorenzo Lopez. Hello, uh, I'm Mike Gallagher. I'm a science education consultant at Oakland Schools and a member of MSTA. Mike, and by the, Mike, by the way, we know because you had those neat <laughs> glasses. We knew you were the science guy. <laughs> <laughs> I get an extra minute for any joke. Yes, that, okay. <laughs> to, to the conversation. Fair. Uh, uh, what I'd like to do is convey how the NGSS, the Next Generation Science Standard, will change the way students experience science in the classroom. And I'm going to start with a conversation prompt. It's on the screen and it's on uh, the handout, uh, the front page of the handout that I shared. And uh, I've used this with a number of groups from boards to teachers and principals. And it shows uh, the depiction of two different um, depictions of, of a really important and compelling science idea, the structure of the earth. And um, when I put that up there, I just ask that they read it and look at it. And then I ask them what they notice about it. And the conversation is always very interesting, and sometimes it goes for as much as an hour or more. Um, so uh, if I could just read these to you. Uh, the one on the left is more how we more typically represent science uh, in today's uh, standards and accountability system. The Earth is divided into concentric spheres. There's an iron-nickel inner core surrounded by a liquid outer core. The mantle is surrounded by a core and is able to flow like a plastic. And the outermost layer is a rigid crust. So we let that sink in, and then we look at the one on the right that says, the currently accepted model of Earth's interior is based largely on the analysis of seismic waves, which indicates that the Earth is comprised of centric spheres. And uh, the next few slides or pictures show some of the things people observe. Uh, they, they notice uh, the Earth is divided, depicts science as determined and static, and it doesn't leave room for students to participate in the enterprise of science. And surprisingly, a lot of times people start by liking that left side and saying it's really clear, but always some, somebody points out that on the right, a phrase like currently accepted model is a more honest depiction of science, and it, it shows that our conclusions are tentative and linked to evidence. Um, the next slides show some other things about how it is positioned students. On the left, it pushed put students into the role of a memorizer. There's an iron nickel inner core surrounded by a liquid outer core. We're on the right, they're looking at an idea that's based largely on an analysis of seismic waves. So here the position of the student is one of an analyzer of evidence. Uh, people look down and obviously the one on the left is more clear and easy to understand. The right is busy with lots of different <coughs> strange looking graphs, but what those graphs are is evidence. And so the space that the students work in is how do we come to build this model that we tentatively accept based on seismic waves. Um, so it's an awesome conversation. And for those who are in earth science and like to follow, uh, here's an, an amazing lesson um, developed by a friend of mine at a group called IRIS, Michael Hubenthal. And it's called Determining and Measuring Earth's Layers Interiors. And in this activity, students assume roles with different tasks, both groups generate evidence, they bring their evidence to the table, and they deliberate on conclusions. And here's the amazing thing. In, over the course of three or four days on this activity, the students actually can determine pretty accurately the size of the outer core of the Earth using free online seismographs. And in doing so, they've, they've compared a theoretical model and an assumption to one that's based on empiricism, data that they can find. They engage in argumentation and draw conclusions based on that evidence. Uh, this slide six shows the, the space that they work within. Just as real scientists do, they start with a research question. What is beneath our feet? They uh, formulate a testable hypothesis. They imagine a homogeneous body, which would have implications for how energy travels. And they apply knowledge. They bring knowledge to the table about wave theory and interactions and energy and matter, and they apply those to this question. Uh, the, um, the, the, the graphs and models down below are the kind of environment that they work within. And as I said, they end up constructing the very conclusion that we might start off by just telling them. 
Um, and the last slide is a photograph from my back deck with my daughter and her friends getting their hands dirty. And I just put that up there to remind me to, to, to point out that the NGSS aims to help students recognize that, that when they do science, they are scientists. And the hope and promise of the NGSS is it changes their sense of identity, their sense of capacity, and it's only through an honest depiction of science, a realistic depiction of science, that we can have a hope for that. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Mike. Thank you. I'm sure you don't need another minute here. You're you got another joke? <laughs> <laughs> Lorenzo Lopez will be the next speaker, followed by Guillermo Lopez. Good afternoon. My name is Lorenzo Lopez. I'm from Lansing, Michigan. I'm the current vice chair for the Lansing for Caesar E. Chavez Committee. We are here to support and recognize the resolution that will be uh, part of today's meeting as Chicano History Week in the state of Michigan. I'd like to first recognize and have the current members of our committee stand who are here in support of the resolution. We have two there. We have six. Stand, please, so you can be recognized. Thank you so much. We are all here today. The great American hero, Cesar Ray Chavez, was a great supporter of education, not only for all Americans, as Americans of Mexican ancestry, our history dates back 100 years now in Michigan, in the great state of Michigan. And it is time that our, the reflections of our contributions and of our history be part of all of the curriculum in the state of Michigan, and that we are here to honor Chicano History Week in the state of Michigan on behalf of the great American hero, Cesar E. Chavez. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Our next speaker, Guillermo Lopez, followed by Paul Benavides. Yeah. I, I don't have enough for everybody, but uh, we'll I'm share. sure the cups. Okay. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Got a sore throat, so excuse me for that. Uh, my name is Guillermo Lopez. I'm a trustee of the Lansing School Board of Education. And I'm here to um, uh, speak on behalf of the uh, resolution to include the life and legacy of Cesare Chavez in the implementation of social studies standards. Uh, in 2003, the Ninth Legislature approved Senate Bill 352. In doing so, the legislature des designated March 31st of each year as Cesare Chavez Day in the state of Michigan. The bill reads in part, the legislature rec recognizes the fundamental contributions of Cesare Chavez made to this nation by organizing farm workers to campaign for safe and fair working conditions, reasonable wages, decent housing, and outlawing of child labor. He embraced the nonviolent principles to crusade against racial and economic discrimination, coordinate voter registration um, <clears throat> efforts, and founded the United Farm Workers of America, along with uh, Dolores Huerta, I may add to that. In 1994, Cesare Chavez was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Honor, the highest honor given to a civilian by the United States government. In memory of this great American, the legislature declared that March 31st of each year shall be known as Cesare Chavez Day in Michigan. Governor Jennifer Granholm signed the bill into law on December 3rd, 2003. Ladies and gentlemen, this man of vision, passion, and determination is already part of Michigan's history. His life and legacy must be included in Michigan School Social Studies standards. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thanks for your service on the Lansing Board, too, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Paul Benavides, please, followed by Nino Rodriguez. My, hello, my name is Sane. Paul Benavides, and I was born and raised in Lansing, Michigan. Um, my parents were migrant workers here from, from the valley, such as Lupe, from Ed Couch, Elsa, Texas. They worked in the fields, and I, and, and I have to be honest, my only time in the fields 
Um, it's documented. I, I believe we have a picture when I was three years old on top of a hood of a truck. Um, they didn't let me get down. Um, that's my only time in the fields. I was fortunate to be raised by, by two humble people who showed me what was important to them in terms of family, church, community, and people. My parents would say hi to people that they felt were familiar. Being in, in Lansing back in the 60s, there weren't too many of us folk here in this area. <coughs> My dad was respectful of everybody. He did teach me to respect anybody of any color. What was fascinating about growing up in that family was I got to learn about some guy, and I, and I call him that because I didn't fully understand who he was. I'm here for the resolution was trying to incorporate the history and legacy of Cesar E. Chavez into our schools. He was some guy back then. I began to learn who he was as I was growing up. Now, I'm not going to pretend to teach the State Board of Education about research, about theories, but I, I do know that research does exist, that students do learn, can relate, can connect better with teachers when they see people that look like them. I was very fortunate about seven years ago, I got a chance to restart a Latino club at one of our local high schools, Lansing Everett High School. A year later, we restarted Lansing Eastern's Latino Club. The next year, we restarted the other high school, Lansing Sexton. So we were running about three Latino clubs. And one of the first questions I would always ask is, do you guys know who Cesar E. Chavez is? And many of the students did not know. And for me to have grown up knowing who he was, to watch my parents march here in Lansing, Chavez picked Lansing as one of the key spots in the country to visit from time to time. He traveled all over the state. He loved Michigan. I think we have to have that presence of his history somewhere instead of, you know, we have, uh, and I say we, I refer to my family. My kids only know about Cesar by what I've told them. Because when they go to school and they can ask the question, sure, they'll get one question and they'll get one answer. But I think it needs to be clearly laid out what he did, who he represented, what he stood for. And in this area, and I believe it's true in a lot of the cities around Michigan, he represented more than just some guy in the fields. He represented what hard work was about, sacrifice, protesting by peaceful measures. So I, I do come before you and, and ask you to, you know, to consider this simply because I, I think it's important. We have one of the highest dropouts rates in the country, being Latinos, Latino slash Hispanic. And something needs to be done. I've been in the schools as a parent, as an advocate, as a Latino club advisor. And I'm telling you what, these kids need something that inspires them. And we've got some absolutely fascinating, wonderful teachers, administrators. I've met some beautiful people through the schools. But I'm telling you what, we need something just a little bit more. We need something that connects. So, but I do thank you for your time. I hope you consider this as, as something, perhaps this is the beginning step something more greater. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Nino Rodriguez is at the table, and Ignacio, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I've got this last name correct, Andnad? Andrade. Ah, okay. Thank you. You got my Last name, perfect. My first name is Nino mm -hmm. Rodriguez. I, let me to congratulate you first for your dedication and your time in the Board of Education for the state of Michigan. Be a board member of the Lansing School District, I know it takes a lot of hours, 
thinking, meetings, sometimes confrontations to get their good resource that we want for all students here in Michigan. We want to have the best students in the world in this state, and I think we can. We have the schools, we have the, the teachers, we have the administrators, we have the leaders in the state that we can have the best uh, students in, in the future. We have to provide the students the knowledge that they need to be number one. And one of them is to let them know about different cultures. I have in front of me the Latino culture that should be implemented in all schools from kindergarten to 12, not only in culture but in language and literature and other subjects that include the Latino culture that we are about 55 million in the, in the United States. We are not talking about outside of the United States, we are talking about us here. I had the honor to walk with Cesar Chavez years back but Cesare Chavez is a man of values. By more of the values, is a man, a person of practicing these values. Sometimes we're talking about values, and until we don't practice them, doesn't change or transform our society. Cesare Chavez tried to change the society by practicing justice, practicing education in others, practicing revolutions to change what was wrong. And that is what is going to stay with us for the future. We are talking about a man that is growing and growing and growing more and more, and we cannot let our students to grow without knowing about Cesare Chavez. We have the opportunity now, because we are going to create a new curriculum, more difficult maybe, but new. And then you are going to have the opportunity to introduce new ideas, new perspective, new historical figures, new models, and one of them is Cesar E. Chavez. I congratulate you one more time for the resolution, but that is not enough. Cesar E. Chavez has <coughs> to live in every family, not only in Michigan, not only the United States, but the whole world, for what he represent, for what he was, the vision that he was having about the humanity and the values and virtues that he was practicing. Let's go to work together to make that a reality for our students and our communities in Michigan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ignacio Anade, did Andrade. I say it? I'm like Andrade. Andretti, but say no that D. Andrade. 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 Say that Not D. from Italy, Andrade. though. <laughs> My apologies. No problem. Thank you for your time and your attention. and. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and start with my remarks. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Ignacio Andrade. I come to you today with two hats. One, as a parent of a student here in the great state of Michigan that was born here. Um, I'm originally from California, so that means a lot to me, but he it has roots here in Michigan, and that will always be with him and my family for the rest of our lives. He is a, in the education system going in, furthering. He's five years, gonna be five, he's five years old now, as of two days ago. And, I come here with my other hat as a commu concerned community member as well. Several people that I work with here in the community uh, have a pleasure to, in my role at Michigan State University, uh, I work in the Office for Inclusion and Intercultural Initiatives. I've had the pleasure of working with several of these hardworking people to help develop plans around Cesar Chavez, a coordinated effort both locally and uh, statewide as well. So I'm very thankful for that. Several people have talked today about science education. As an engineer, I too am concerned with the future of science and STEM education in the state and the nation. In particular, the underperformance of Chicano Latino students in these areas. The alarming data concerning how Latinos are being left behind in education, when combined with current and future projections 
of the tremendous growth of the Latino community should warrant every leader who is concerned, I should say this, every leader, not just every leader, but every leader who is concerned with the success of Michigan and the nation because the success of this state and the nation is directly tied to the success of Latinos. I am here for another reason, to focus and highlight BWB, not BWL across the street and all the controversy <laughs> surrounding that. Thank you. BWB, the black, white binary that has a chokehold on the state of Michigan. Many folks don't realize this, especially if you are from the black or white community. I am not originally from here, so it is glaring. I come from California where the biggest population is Latinos. Being in Michigan, I have come to an alarming reality that there is a big grown folks table, in my perception, and then a kid's table. And I am tired of having to feel like Latino and Native and Asian and any other issues that are not concerning black and white communities are important stuff, but after we get to the grown folks business at the grown folks table, we'll get to the kids table stuff. That's also important too. And so I come to you today, the black white binary that many folks have to deal with on a regular basis is directly tied to what we're talking about here today in Chavez education and the underperformance of Chicano Latino students. There is a, for instance, in the East Lansing School Districts, many of you may know, there is a task force or review committee that is designated for the achievement gap between white and black students. But many folks don't know that within the East Lansing School District, there is that gap. But the gap between white and Latino students is even greater. That draws me alarm, that draws me great concern, especially as my son may very soon be going in that direction. And so I, I see this as something that can be remedied, but it has to come from all areas, from the ground organic, as the folks out here have been trying very hard to do, and from the top at the state. I work at MSU. I'd have the pleasure with a lot of the folks here uh, to found the four, this year will be the fourth, but the annual Cesare Chavez commemorative celebration at MSU. It is now in its fourth year. <coughs> the MLK commemorative celebration at MSU has been celebrated now for 34 years, as it should be. But only four years for Cesar Chavez, it just barely broke the chokehold of the black-white binary. A result is many MSU students, community members, faculty, staff, are not aware of Cesar Chavez. Mm -hmm. Even within the Latino community that have grown up in the schools here in the state of Michigan. That is unacceptable. Michigan was once a beacon of not only hope, but of cutting edge technology for the world. Over. If the Michigan and the leaders of Michigan have any desire to be able to take that play, the state of Michigan back to that glorious place of a leader worldwide, innovation, STEM, engineering, research, development that the world and Michigan can be proud of again, it has to incorporate the education and the fostering of pride within the Latino community. A great way to do that is by introducing folks that look like them. We're not only talking about Christopher Columbus. We're not only talking about certain populations of groups. We're talking about the real history of people that look like them. They can be motivated, see people that look like them, carry on, be identified as, as people that can be those leaders themselves, and sit in the positions that, that all of you as esteemed leaders in our state that we are all very proud of now sit in. And that's the end of my comments. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much. Our, our final speaker of the day is Margarito J. Garcia. Unless there's any more forms. Does anyone have any forms? Yeah. I'm going to just leave these for passing around to one side. Um, I want to just... Uh, address the a couple of issues and, and I'll hopefully make it short. And if I forget about Abraham Maslow before I stop, uh, remind me so I can mention Abraham Maslow at the end. For uh, those who don't know me, my name is Margarito Jaques Garcia III. 
Uh, my family runs back to uh, the Southwest uh, since before the Texas uh, Independence uh, War with Mexico and, uh, the, and before the Mexican uh, War for Independence against Spain. And the two sides of my family uh, had lands in various parts of, of Mexico and West Texas. Uh, my middle name is Jaquez. Felipe Jaquez was a, a viceroy for, for the king of Spain who had uh, power over m almost all of uh, Mexico up to, to the Texas panhandle. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to brag about those things because that's my, my ancestry, okay, and that's that. The thing that I'm here to tell you about is what happened this past week. Uh, uh, the handout is a celebration for all of us. And uh, uh, you can see from the uh, document you have is a copy of a resolution, a resolution uh, passed by the legislature on January 29th, thanks to Andy Shore. And, and you see the list of representatives that, uh, that uh, participated in this. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have been asked to draft uh, the language and to help uh, Andy's office with the final editing. What I learned from this was that for anybody that questions any legislative support for Chicano history in Michigan, you have evidence that we've got support. Okay, this is in your face right here now with something from your legislators. And that's, that's powerful. That says, listen to us. And so the, the, the other takeaway was that when this was celebrated in uh, the Lansing uh, uh, School District, uh, it was so well received and so joyful and so powerfully uh, uh, pride raising uh, that uh, the, the outcome of that has, has, has people haven't stopped talking about it yet. So it's it's just an indication that from the community itself, when we had a celebration where the students from the high school read the wording of the legislation, it was so so great for the kids. It was so great for their parents. It was great for the school. I mean, everybody won. So win win all the way from the legislature down to grassroots. And then the other thing that's happening is uh, everybody's wanting to have a copy to put in their office or, or in their uh, home or something of this legislation that shows evidence of Michigan being able to do something about having support for history about Ch Chicanos and, and also Latinos. When you have uh, 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 proof of that, you then can springboard off of that. And the one thing I, I wanted to mention to you is that um, I am. Uh, I have a, a doctorate in, in CNI, curriculum instruction from U of M, and uh, in that capacity, we learn how to do uh, uh, analysis of curriculum and, and scope and sequence and depth and, 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 and breadth of, of, of coverage and, and uh, grade applicability and, and the whole nine yards. And so we have to look at the big picture of, of K through 12 impact of curriculum, right? And so in, in that capacity. I, I went over the social studies uh, curriculum guidelines uh, put out by uh, the Michigan Department of Education, and, and I saw Cesar Chavez jumping out of uh, uh, geography, teaching of geography, teaching of history, teaching of labor, teaching of economics, uh, teaching of, of, of farm culture, teaching of, of numerous uh, aspects of the curriculum from K through 12 about things that are happening in, in, in Michigan and in the nation and of which Cesar Chavez played a major significant role. And that, that is really key to what I'm here for. It's professionally right. Curriculum and instruction wise, science and art of curriculum says you can't ignore the things that are important. And if you, you already don't know this, there's a, a, a motion picture coming out soon in about a month or so I heard that uh, a full length movie on uh, Cesar Chavez and that basically is something that the kids are gonna really, really love and before I leave, I need to also talk about whom? Gandhi, who was a, 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 a Cesar Chavez was a major uh, admirer of Gandhi and, 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 a, and uh, a follower. And you can look at the impact of Gandhi on the world, and you, you need not argue that he, that he was a major influence. And uh, what he did was he was the archetypical uh, Mexican-American poor man, humble man, that made a rise in impact on society. If kids can't have that knowledge that they can make a difference, what, what do you want education for? This man did it from peasant all the way to almost saint. He almost has saint-like qualities uh, uh, by, from, from the opinion of many people, and I tend to agree with that. So basically, you have now 
evidence that the ag uh, legislature will support things. You have evidence from the, the, the media, from, the, 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 from one a specialist in curriculum instruction. You have evidence from, from so many quarters of your, uh, of your society and your, and your uh, people that you're going to be working with if you uh, include Cesar Chavez in the curriculum. And why do I want to speak about Abraham Maslow? Because you know, if you're going to be a teacher, you have to learn about Abraham Maslow, uh, 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 hierarchy of needs, right? And, and the, the top is self-actualization. That's the one where, that's where the learning takes place. The bottom one is safety and, and, and knowing that you're going to be okay, you're not going to get hurt. What's in the middle that all kids need to get through before they learn? Belonging. They have to have a sense of belonging. If they see a, an Hispanic in the curriculum, they say, I belong to this country. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have, I have received two more forms um, from Al Salas and Karina Salinas. Mr. Salas, if you'd come to the table first, please. Salise. Sorry, I'm mispronouncing names. I apologize. It's okay. Al Salas, once again, thank you for having me. You got it right. And for listening to our concerns. Myself, I'm here also to support the resolution for Mr. Cesar E. Chavez uh, on our educational system here in Lansing. I am a small business owner here in Lansing. And I'm not here to talk about my business. I'm here to talk about the importance the importance in our school system to know about one of our true leaders. We have a couple of great leaders in American history, Mr. Martin Luther King, Mr. Cesar Chavez. Mr. Cesar Chavez, he was not only a Navy veteran that served our country well, he was also the first, I repeat again, the first American Union labor uh, organizer, the very first one the organizer or farms uh, unions. He was a father, just like myself. And he was not only for Hispanics. The reason why we eat the fruits and vegetables that we do and that the farmers are being more, uh, with less pesticides and less harm to our fruits and vegetables, it was because of what he did. He died fighting for what he believed on. And so a lot of my colleagues had stated, it was another, like Mr. He followed Mr. Gandhi and Mr. Martin Luther King in nonviolence, which is something that a lot of us are. This is why we, we teach our kids, and we want the rest of our, the kids, not only Hispanics, but all of all ethnic races, uh, religion, uh, to know who he was. There has been in the past. Uh, People have confused Mr. Cesar Chavez for Hugo Chavez from Venezuela. <laughs> People don't know who he is. Uh, we had a hard time passing a, passing a street here in the city of Lansing, the state capital of Michigan. But we have a street name in um, a good, uh, most of our cities, major cities here in Lansing. The biggest reason was because nobody knew who he was. I think it's time we start in a school district teaching our kids a little bit about who he was. I, um, with this, I, I leave that in. Hopefully that you will look into this and hopefully you can support this resolution. And there are a lot of us here that would like to talk to you more. If there's some more, we have a website. You can look into it and he has his own website. Thank you for having me. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker of the day is Karina Salinas. They usually say they save the best for last, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, my name is Karina Salinas, and I actually wear multiple hats myself. Um, but today I'm here in support of the resolution for the Cesar Chavez Committee. Uh, I have been raised ancestors of migrant workers working in the fields. Um, I remember back in high school, I was going to have my first year in high school, and I called my aunt a week before, actually, let me rephrase that, two months before school started, and I said, 
can you give me a little history of our um, ancestry and what we did work, working in the fields as grandparents? And she said, sure, come over tomorrow at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> and I said, 5.30 in the morning? I'll be sleeping at 5.30. If you want to know some more about what our grandparents did, be here at 5.30 in the morning. So I went there at 5.30 in the morning. I rode my bike over there. She lived just two streets away, and I rode my bike over there. And she was waiting for me, and she said, let's go. I said, where are we going? Get in the car. Got in the car with her, and we drove out to Comstock in the fields where the migrant workers were. She gave me gloves, a bucket, a hat, a scarf, and said, here's your new job for the next two months. You want to know the history of what our ancestors went through for the next two months, you'll be picking cucumbers right along with them. And I looked at her and I said, you have to be kidding me. And she said, if you really, really sincerely want to know what it was like to work hard, you will do this. And I'm very grateful today. She's no longer here. Rest in peace. I miss her dearly. Uh, she was very active in the community, the church, Crystal Ray Church and, and Cesar Chavez. Uh, very well liked, very well loved, but I thank her for that because I learned a lesson from that. And the lesson that I learned from that is the importance of understanding that people perish because of lack of knowledge. If you have not been told the life story of anyone, not just Cesar Chavez, how are you going to explain it to the rest of your children, your grandchildren, and those that ask you? Had I not asked, I wouldn't have known what it was like. She could have said, oh, they worked hard from 5 in the morning till 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night. But had she not taken me and showed me in form of action and doing it, I would have never known. And for that, I'm forever grateful. But in regards to what we are here for today and supporting this resolution, Cesar Chavez, as uh, everyone has said on our committee, I am also part of the Cesar Chavez committee. Um, it's been said here today. He was a big activist. He, he helped the community. He helped the world. He, brought, he worked in labor laws. He, he helped do accomplish a lot of things. But you know what is the, the most important thing that I find in the life and legacy story of Cesar Chavez? He wasn't about the fame and the fortune. He was seeking one thing and one thing only, and that was opportunity. He wanted the opportunity to be able to speak on what was right. He wanted the opportunity to be able to share with other people to get along, to work together of all diverse cultures. He was not one that wanted to have everything was all about me, 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 me. All he, see, all he was seeking was opportunity. And so all I would like to say today in regards to supporting the Cesar Chavez resolution is that you would take in consideration that we are asking for an opportunity to be able to implement into the schools the history and the story of Cesar Chavez so that those of us, not only in our culture, because this isn't about so that our, our culture will get better and understand better, it's for all cultures to understand the same way we study in the life of Martin Luther King or any other part of history or social studies or government. We just need to get educated more and there are so many things that we could say more to our kids but who better than to teach on the life and legacy of Cesar Chavez than in the school board in the school district. And all we're asking for is what Cesar Chavez seeked and what he was seeking, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This doesn't take you want to do it now? Are you going to do it now? Yes. John was proposing that. And just before okay. we do for a second, I'd like to say, you know, our own valued MDE member sitting right in front and Ruby Zavia, we want to recognize you and thanks for your contributions here at the department.
We have a plan. Okay. Yeah, it did. Go. Takes a while for those radio tubes to heat up. Remember that? <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> if you hit it a couple times. It's not old enough. You have to wait for the TV to kind of start. This is Caesar. Wrong Caesar. Chavez. No, not him. Caesar Chavez. Not him either. This is Cesar Chavez. You know, the one who was born in Yuma, Arizona, worked in the fields, joined the Navy, started a family, and because of his life's work, ended up with his own national monument, a Presidential Medal of Freedom, Time Magazine cover, statues, murals, murals, murals. The man has lots of murals. A Google Doodle, his own holiday in three U.S. states, Apple ads, stamps. Do you have a stamp? You don't have a stamp. Libraries, schools, parks, streets, highways, and a naval ship, all named after him. A ship? Yeah, a ship. And when people compare him to famous Americans, they use words like inspiration, pioneer, luminary, legend, hero. But why? It all started with a grape. Well, lots of grapes. All of us are looking for a union for farm workers. Cesar Chavez fought for farm workers' rights to a fair wage, lunch breaks, bathrooms, and access to clean water. He had a vision of equality and social change for all people. And some people agreed. Our separate struggles are really one. A struggle for freedom, for dignity, and for humanity. We are together with you in spirit and determination that our dreams for a better tomorrow will be realized. In 1962, we co-founded a group that became the first successful farm workers union in American history. Steadfast in nonviolence. He marched with supporters 340 miles to the state capitol, completed a 25-day water-only fast, all in the middle of a great boycott that swept the nation for five years until... victory for thousands of farm workers. Cesar Chavez continued his fight for farm workers until his death in 1993, but his message of nonviolence, unity, justice, and the rights of all people continues on today. He's Cesar Chavez, an American, a hero, you can honor Caesar's work and the millions he's inspired by urging the president to declare a national day of service for Caesar Chavez. Go to takepart.com slash Chavez. Sign the petition. Continue the legacy. Excellent. The board member, Ramos Martini, okay. you'd like to... Pick the rest of this off, please. Thank you. State Board of Education resolution honoring Cesar Estrada Chavez. Whereas Cesar Estrada Chavez was an American hero, a civil rights leader, Latino, farm worker, and a labor leader, a religious and spiritual figure, a community servant, and a social entrepreneur a crusader for nonviolence and social change, an environmentalist <coughs> and a consumer advocate. And whereas Cesar, a second generation American, was born on March 31st, 1927, near his family's farm in Yuma, Arizona. And at the age of 10, his family became migrant farm workers after losing their farm in the Great Depression. And throughout his youth <coughs> and into his adulthood, Cesar migrated across the Southwest United States, laboring in the fields and vineyards, where he was exposed to the hardships and the injustices of farm worker life. And whereas Cesar's dream was to create an organization to protect and serve farm workers. And in 1962, he founded 
the National Farm Workers Association and later became the United Farm Workers of America. And whereas for more than three decades, Cesar led the first successful farm workers union in American history, achieving dignity, respect, fair wages, medical coverage, pension benefits, and humane living conditions, as well as countless other rights and protections for hundreds of thousands of farm workers. And against previously insurmountable, insurmountable odds, he led successful strikes and boycotts that resulted in the first industry-wide labor contracts in the history of American agriculture. And whereas his union efforts brought about the passage of the groundbreaking 1975 California Agricultural Labor Relations Act to protect farm workers, and today it remains the only law in the nation that protects farm workers' right to unionize. And whereas Cesar, a strong believer in the principles of nonviolence practiced by Gandhi and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., effectively employed peaceful tactics such as fasts, boycotts, strikes, and pilgrimages. And whereas in 1968, he fasted for 25 days to affirm his personal commitment and that of the Farm Labor Union to nonviolence, and he fasted again for 25 days in 1972, and in 1988, at the age of 61, he endured a 36-day fast for life. To highlight the harmful impact of pesticides on farm workers and their children. And whereas Cesar passed away in his sleep on April 23rd, 1993, in San Luis, Arizona, only miles from his birthplace of 66 years later, earlier, and more than 50,000 people attended his funeral services in the small town of Delano, California, the same community in which he had planted his seed for social justice only decades before. And whereas on December 3rd, 2003, Governor Jennifer Granholm signed Public Act 225 of 2003 to designate March 31st of each year as Cesar E. Chavez Day in the state of Michigan. And whereas on May 5th, 2012, the Navy christened and launched the dry cargo ammunition ship in USNS Cesar Chavez in a ceremony at the General Dynamics Nest NASSCO shipyard in San Diego honoring Cesar who served the Navy during World War I. And whereas on October the 8th, 2012, President Barack Obama established the Cesar E. Chavez National Monument in Keene, California. The site marks the extraordinary achievements and contributions to the history of the United States made by Cesar e. Chavez and the farm worker movement that he led with great vision and fortitude. La Paz reflects his conviction that ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And whereas on March 28th, 2014, Cesar Chavez, an American hero, an upcoming film directed by Diego Luna, will be released starting Michael Peña as Chavez and John Malkovich as the owner of the large industrial grape farm who led the opposition to Chavez's organizing effort. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the State Board of Education 
recognizes the life, legacy, and contributions of Cesar Estrada Chavez and be it finally resolved that the State Board of Education recognizes that local education agencies determine curriculum and strongly encourages the inclusion of lessons of Cesar Estrada Chavez as appropriately referenced in the grade level contact expectations and high school contact expectations in the social studies standards. Thank you. So that was moved by I formally move the resolution moved by Lupe Ramos Montini and supported by Eileen Weiser. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, why don't we move? I'm going to go back to uh, the next item, which is uh, introduction of new employees. And by the way, we've been fortunate to just get great people in the department to join the team. Here's another one today, Catherine. Is, well, I'm going to let Joseph actually do the formal introduction, but uh, please. Uh, it is my <coughs> Maybe wait one second. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. I know. <laughs> Thank you. So, Joseph, please. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Catherine Weigen, who is new to us. Uh, she comes uh, via higher education. She was uh, working specifically in teacher education uh, with, with focus on special education, if I recall correctly. We are very lucky to have her. Uh, Catherine, would you please stand up and let us know a little bit about what you do for the department? Yes. Thank you. I work for the Office of Professional Preparation Services as a higher education consultant. I work on program approvals and standards review and accreditation support. So thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Welcome. welcome. And you're welcome to stay. The rest gets even more exciting. <laughs> Including the minutes right now. We're going to do the minutes. Watch this. Okay. <laughs> no, that's true. I, you know what? I, I, you don't know how hard. I move support. Thank you. Thank you. Merch works her tail off. I'd like to read the excellent minutes dramatically into the record. Okay. I'm so confident <laughs> is there is there a motion by John supported by Dan, right? Yep. Seconds to those he, minutes. Since he, All, he signed them. Any yeah, yep. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about that. You All in favor, aye. 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 All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you. President's <laughs> report. John, please. I have, I have, a, I have a Cesar Chavez inspiration story, but I'll wait for Luke to get back in the room. Um, so I, all I want to say is I think the discussion with um, my head teacher and Philip was terrific, and I'm glad we're uh, continuing this process of publicly discussing the big issues in terms of where we go. Um, what I am uh, encouraging and trying to help organize, and we probably should lay it out a little more fully, so the next couple meetings to invite some of the leading experts and policy folks again, and then probably turn to invite various stakeholder folks to bring forward their perspective issue recommendations 
and um, we also discuss uh, how we can begin to over time wrestle with what we're hearing and come up with some sort of process to do that together. But so what I've um, got teed up for the next two meetings <coughs> to your approval it would be we heard from University of Michigan and Wayne State today, um, Michigan State University, probably David Arson or Bob Floden or both, at the, and the Citizens Research Council next time. Uh, and then Ed Council? Trust, Citizens, Citizens oh, Research okay. Council, CRC. And then the following meeting is Mackinac Center and Ed Trust. Um, so I think that will be a good sequence of. of uh, don't miss that one. Yeah, I don't actually, get the high ratings. ratings. <laughs> 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 so. That'll bust all internet. Uh, I'll, I'll tell Lupe this separately, <laughs> but I was reminded there's um, <coughs> moons ago, it seems in the 90s, when I was working on a project with uh, the U.S. Department of Education around how do we encourage and support really good charter schools as they were new. Uh, charter schools, in this case, that were developed in partnership with leading community institutions, businesses. Uh, we both looked around the country and then provide technical assistance to schools like um, I mean, they didn't need any help, but Henry Ford Academy that you and Steve Hamp and Renee Lurch created. Here's a great institution, um, Ford Motor, the Henry Ford Museum, a learning environment. One of the schools we found was this, there's an assistant principal in D.C., um, Irasima Salcido, she was Mexican. She was so frustrated with the poor education that her kids were getting. She said, I'm going to do something about it. She went and started her own charter school. Uh, determined to educate the kids who were both black and brown, who weren't getting educated in Southeast DC. She, um, she uses her text, what's the institutions, what's the work of Washington? It's public policy and government. And she called the school the Cesar Chavez School of Public Policy. And it was just getting started. And when I saw this thing, I mean, as Mike's right, I'm a policy wonk. What a wonderful idea to use the text of public policy making and draw in the institutions and seek help for them, and text from, and mentorships and internships from all these, you know, think tanks, government agencies. And she didn't know anybody. She didn't have any connections. This is Irasima Salcido, who started the Cesar Chavez School of Public Policy. And a lot of us helped and helped her raise her first money and make connections to other groups. Um, and it worked. Years later now, she's got three or four campuses. Um, it's 90% plus. Latino and African American, they're all getting educated, they're all going to college. And um, Oprah, you know, embraced her, the Gates Foundation gave her money, I mean, she's on a roll, but she was just a determined um, Mexican American assistant principal who was so frustrated that her kids, the kids, weren't learning from the other side of the tracks in DC. That she went and created an institution and now a set of institutions to do better, and they are. And it's in the, it's Cesar Chavez's legacy, come alive and working mm -hmm. to support the next generation of uh, well-educated people who are going to change the world again. So uh, I just really was reminded of this wonderful person who did that, uh, another uh, follower in, uh, in the tradition of Cesar Chavez. So thank you for bringing that uh, resolution and that thank you all for your set support. of um, friends here to, to the board. They were wonderful. Yeah. That's great. Thanks for adjusting the calendar or the agenda so we could accommodate our friends here today. That was excellent. And I know you're you're a very private person, but your own story is very inspirational to us. So we appreciate when you've shared that. Um, my report, a couple of items. It's a little, you know, I'm not going to cut it short today. There's a couple of important items. One is I mentioned in the mid month, but I'm in the spirit of trying to get other options for schools for schools into the state reform district. That means not having an exclusive arrangement with the EAA. So that would allow us when the law, hopefully the law takes place, to have some other options in addition to the EAA. And I've mentioned at this meeting and in other forums before that, you know, perhaps the best one for some schools would be, if a school were to be named, would be a district next door that has a very similar school, similar de demographics, and has turned that school around. So in that spirit, we're working out a contract as such to, to to not have that exclusivity, but I wouldn't want that to be read as any judgment one way or the other. It's in the spirit of we need to have other options, and I plan to have those, and that's what I'm exercising on our part. We think that'll be resolved in the next couple of days. Uh, Smarter Balance, I, I can't thank the board enough for those who've worked on it, and even when you're peppered with questions, don't feel bad about it, uh, Richard Ziley. I mean, it's tough duty to get up in front of these folks, so 
Um, but I, I do think it's the right thing. I don't think we should jeopardize our waiver. Um, I said at the Ed Alliance yesterday that though there's one, one organization that's kind of opposed to this. It's heartfelt probably on their part, but we really feel strongly it needs to be the smarter balance. That's what we know is going to be aligned. And then this December, when we go out for bid again, if ACT and others want to bid for the next go-around, great. But at this point in time, we've had a three-year plan going. We respected the board's decision to go to Common Core three years ago. We started right away, as you know, on the smarter balance um, pathway. And, uh, and that would culminate with uh, uh, tests in the spring of 15. And one of the reasons, among many, that I kind of, uh, we were, you know, the, the, that'll be my last couple of months is because I think it's important for the current team to kind of bring that to the end and then and then turn it over to another team well to another superintendent same team I hope these are great people <laughs> yeah. yeah let me let me start with that again this is a great team in place I'd be the only one replaced you're gonna do great in that Pistons coaching I am I, I <laughs> boy he ran off with that Paul W it's in I saw a tweet about it I'm good with that I think I could actually do that as well as some of them, anyway. <laughs> it's not a high bar there. You get a high salary, but it doesn't last long. No, that's right. Uh, so, you know, I think in that spirit, um, and we're really hopeful and continue that support. It's really important to us and our team downstairs. It, it's a little demoralizing for them, and, and Joseph's above this kind of stuff, but I would say, you know, it's a strain on him even also to, um, to, to have the push back on that. As I said, if, if, it, if the next set after a new set of bids comes out and it, and it says it should be the ACT down the road, then so be it. And just for clarification, one more time, this still includes the ACT test for college entrance. This is the Smarter Balance is a wraparound of that, and then it would have other, other tests that would be aligned to the Common Core throughout. So there's even been, we could tell yesterday, and Wendy got on that, that, that uh, I'll just say it, Mike Bullis alerted me to the fact that there's a lot of legislators that keep thinking that whole ACT thing's going away. So, so one more chance. Yeah. Well, you'd have the college, you know, the ACT that's, that colleges use that's to receive problem. kids. We'd always have that. And then, and then the, the wraparound questions and the stuff that Joseph and his team, 30 states have been working on. Um, so I, we seem to have a lot of support for that. I wrote a note earlier this week that I copied you. Uh, I wrote to the field that, but we're kind of done. You know, we're going to answer questions and all that. And uh, I, I wanted it to be clear, and I could tell from Met Alliance yesterday that they got it, that if this goes down and we don't have a test that aligns and we actually lose our waiver, it's on them. So I have every confidence that a couple of them are working now to try to get specific agreements from their organizations to support Smarter Balance uh, Thursday. So let's hope for that. Uh, culture of reading, you know, I, 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 I was the first uh, donor of that uh, in your name, uh, as I indicated in our, in our uh, kind of our, where Anna and I appreciated the work you do. And so in our, quote, holiday Christmas gift, uh, we said we'd, we'd donate in your honor. And there's been many others that have donated since then. I just wanted to give you an update on, on what's going to happen. We've aligned it with the Michigan, the mm. Library of Michigan. Carol's really worked on this directly. We talked about it at Soup's Group. And uh, it's going to have a two-pronged approach. It's to coordinate donations to provide copies of Michigan Reads books to students in classrooms and early education settings based on their teacher's commitment. This is the key. It would be the teacher's commitment to use the books to promote scientifically based reading instruction and or family engagement activities focused on literacy. Reading instruction and family engagement, because a lot of this is you can, there's a lot of programs out there that they give a book, but the parents don't read. And, and that, or, or it ends up on a shelf. So we're committed to making this work in a way that we think will be real. The mechanism for selecting students in classrooms to receive books is going to be dependent on developed criteria for, uh, by, by folks in the department here. And just as an aside, we're also going to have at the bottom of our website other options. So if people say, well, I really want to contribute to the United Way of Southeast Michigan that already has a program that's more unique, they're going to be able to hit that. You know, we're not looking to compete with those. We're looking to find a niche that's a little different, and it's particularly for poor kids. It's particularly for folks that could have, you know, the total encompassing, not just receive a book in the mail, which is also a value. It's just that for some families, they need more concentrated effort. 
And then we're going to continue to connect with donors. I've got on my schedule to talk to some of the major CEOs that I think we're going to, I'm hopeful we're going to be able to engage in this because that's where the real money will come in. It, it's nice if people make a personal contribution, but it, the real money has to come from folks. I think it's Kellogg, as a matter of fact, that supports the United Way one to a, to a large degree in southeast Michigan. So we're going to try to seek the same thing. And uh, it's at Michigan dot gov slash culture of reading and we're real proud of the start we've kind of put together as a team I think it aligns well with our with our and the board's feeling that uh, uh, it isn't as simple as just holding kids back if they're not reading at grade level it's trying to give families and those kids tools so they can succeed in reading by grade level at third grade and this is in that spirit Summer food service program, you probably read about that in some of the releases that Marty's put together. Uh, but it, it, we do need more partners. We, we have money that goes un, unused. Uh, so that's why there's been quite a, an outreach on our part. And it's to make a real difference in the lives during the summer. Of, we literally have, you could hear today, these, these stats are, are frightening when you have 70% free and reduced lunch in certain places that you heard today. And, and, and in, in the place up north, 73%. So the idea is that we're really reaching out because uh, Kyle and his team kind of coordinate this within uh, Carol's leadership, and it's going to help Michigan. It's called the Summer Meet Up and Eat Up initiative to run summer food programs. So we're calling on schools, churches, local government. We don't care. We're good with partners that are credible to, to help make this happen, and um, we're looking for folks and would appreciate, you know, we only got one media guy left here, although... Some other people usually watch us on the internet here, but any any uh, any help by March <laughs> one, uh, you can contact our summer food service program at michigan.gov/sfsp. Mike, can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Are there any particular areas that are underserved in parts of the state? Yes. I would say the inner cities. We really struggle with um, churches are wonderful. Um, sometimes schools um, reach out to the churches and other civic organizations, uh -huh. and then, of course. Northern tier, where there's not quite as many sponsors, and so there's a lot of coordinated efforts, but then it's more difficult for kids to get, yeah, there. get there. Yeah, but it's, it's growing every year and with the outreach that we're doing. It's wonderful. Okay. Thank you. And our theme on that is just hunger doesn't take a summer vacation, right? So, I mean, we're really right. committed to this and, and we'll, we'll keep uh, pushing the ball, but would appreciate any, any help you might have with some contacts that any of the board members have. So that completes my re report. Now we'll go to the always the one that's more fun. And all this. <laughs> Gary, please. We're looking forward to this. And as I said to you on the way out, I respect your courage for wearing those pants. <laughs> <laughs> There's only two times of year where you can wear red pants: Valentine's Day yes. and Christmas. <laughs> so. I love the matching tie and pants. It's quite coordinated. Well, as Mike said, you get an extra minute now because, you know. <laughs> right. Thanks. <laughs> well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And it's been really interesting this last month to be able to spend some time out of town. <laughs> we had the, the first National State Teachers of the Year conference was in January. So I'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, but I'll be talking about a couple of big projects that I've been working on, a couple of smaller projects, and a couple of um, opportunities I've had to speak around the state about education in my role this year. Uh, so hopefully you've, you've probably seen that the Olympics have gotten underway. It was an 80% success, as far as <laughs> I can tell. That's, it, yeah. But there's still a couple weeks left to go, so it may, it may pick back up. Wait, who, who's, who's dead or in exile because of that? Yeah. Right. I know you're right. Not that 15-year-old Russian figure skater. She's not in exile. Right. She's great. Yeah. Watch your back, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> so this month started out with an event that we had, as I mentioned before, in Gross Point right now, we're trying to update our technology infrastructure and move towards an infrastructure that's more capable of helping us to perform digital learning in classrooms K-12. And that um, has brought up a bunch of questions. We're updating our FAQ document weekly for the community, but we were asked to put together a panel discussion where there was an opportunity for community members to come, uh, come and ask questions in person. So the League of Women Voters in Gross Point hosted a uh, forum just about a month ago where they brought together myself, 
the superintendent of public instruction in Gross Point, and then our su deputy superintendent for business. Wait, 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 wait. I'm the superintendent of public instruction. He's just the superintendent. <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> 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 Another minute. Yeah. Superintendent of schools. Okay, yeah. Superintendent of schools in Gross Point. There you go. Um, and our, our business director and myself participated in a panel discussion where we answered questions about the technology updates and the kind of the the future vision for teaching and learning in, in digital learning for Gross Point. As I mentioned, I had the opportunity to spend some time in a place that was a little bit warmer than here, Scottsdale, Arizona, was the site of our first national conference for the State Teachers of the Year program, hosted by the Council of Chief State School Officers. And this was a really exciting opportunity. And what I've learned is that in meeting all the other State Teachers of the Year, many of them are just getting started in their year. It runs a calendar year, as you may have heard in the past whereas the year in Michigan runs a school year. So we had a, a variety of different experiences to share. Some, some teachers of the year were just getting started in their, their duties, and some had been doing it for um, a number of months like myself. But we had an opportunity to gather and, and share in a bunch of different leadership activities and trainings. We worked with um, policy design, we worked with communications, we worked on what it means to be a state teacher of the year. We collaborated on a number of ideas and projects, sharing um, examples from our classrooms, sharing examples from our state teacher of the year work, and what's happening in each state. So Anne-Marie Smith from the Department of Education and I attended this event together, and she had a chance to meet with several of the coordinators from the other states and share some of the practices that they're doing in other states as part of their program. We also had an opportunity to meet the coordinators from the, chief, the Council of Chief State School Officers, who, one of whom, his name is John Quam. He celebrated his 25th year with the CCSSO, and there was a surprise event one of the evenings that we were there, and they brought 13 of the past 25 National Teachers of the Year together, and they gave us a really great training and uh, did a panel discussion with us, which was just wonderful as far as leadership mentorship goes. And then we had an opportunity to take a group photo, so this is all of us there together. But just what a, what a wonderful opportunity for learning and being able to bring back some project ideas to Michigan from other states and to be able to share some of the things that we're doing here, um, especially yes. some of the work we mentioned this morning with early childhood education to teachers in other states as well. From there, I had an opportunity to visit Bay City Public Schools, which is um, an area very close to where I went to graduate school in Saginaw Valley State University. So I had the opportunity to speak at their district-wide professional development day and also run a, some breakout session work with teachers there on teacher leadership. Additionally, I had the opportunity to be part of a panel discussion last week at Wayne State University with Mike Adonisio, who we saw this morning. And we were part of the third annual Poverty Conference at Wayne State, and we brought together, they brought together business, education, um, and community individuals for this panel discussion um, with the idea of how do we all work together to address poverty in our schools and in our, in our youth. Uh, we had a, a medium-sized event that I was able to be part of a team putting this together in Gross Point just about a week or so ago called the Student Technology Showcase. It's modeled after an event that's hosted by McCall that's at the state capitol each year where student teams get together and show what they're doing with technology in their classrooms and how it's enhancing learning. So we had 24 classrooms. We had each of our um, 14 schools was represented with one or more classroom teams presenting different and innovative ways that they're using technology to enhance learning. This is a group of elementary students who are showing how they were using iPads that they got through a grant. Um, they're piloting iPad technology to support um, instruction in their classroom. They're showing it how they use back channel discussions to communicate with each other, how they use multimedia tools to provide narrated presentations um, as part of project based learning. My, a, my wife's cousin, Michael Gomzalski, is with his arms folded and his wife, Paige. Oh, really? told you you can't turn around in Gross Point without <laughs> pumping it. <laughs> 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 it must have some of their, their kids, must be at that school. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. that, and that's probably true. We had over 300 people attended from the community came out to see the, the student presentations, which were just wonderful. Um, and, that's so, a, and that's a medium-sized event in your world right now. <laughs> right now it is. 300 people. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty impressive. It is. 
He's in the insurance business too. If you need oh. any insurance, <laughs> his father, Uncle Bo, insists, just tells me what insurance I need. You have another kid, you're buying more insurance. In about a month, I will probably have to have that conversation, so I may circle back right. around to that recommendation. <laughs> Um, another larger project that I had the, the privilege of being part of over the past six months, um, Mike Gallagher from Oakland Schools and Sarah Coleman, who's a science consultant at Muskegon ISD, as well as a number of teachers and other math science center leaders from around the state, got together and we wrote a math science partnership grant last year to bring professional learning opportunities for science and math teachers here in Michigan and to put together a, a two-year program that would help us to ramp up our, our math science professional development around the state. This grant was recently approved for $1.6 million and we're going to be running 12, um, essentially they're graduate courses for science and, and math teachers around the state over the next two summers. We're going to run them as workshop institutes so there'll be three-week accelerated courses where the teachers will meet and work together with facilitators for 15 straight full days. Um, and they'll be exposed to best practice instruction in science and math. And these things will be able to help us build our, our instructional supports in the state um, and help to support teaching and learning in the math and science areas um, at all grade levels in the, in the coming years. <coughs> so I'm really excited to be part of this project. And right now we're in the planning stages to put together workshops for physics and chemistry this coming summer in um, four different areas of Michigan. So we're looking to target a coordinated effort with all the math science centers and be able to support <coughs> teachers in each of the major regions of Michigan. So we'll have workshops going on Southeast Michigan, Southwest, Northeast, and Northwest to try to reach as many teachers as we can. And over the next two years, hopefully build our facilitator pool through training so that we can have extended opportunities in the future to be able to, to do some sustainable support of teachers um, in math science training. <coughs> And then finally, I think I mentioned this to you last, last month, that we geared up for our fourth annual physics cardboard boat races, which was just yesterday at Gross Point North High School. And this is an annual tradition now that was started four years ago where we bring all of our physics students together and the kids have to solve this engineering problem of building a boat out of cardboard and duct tape that can support the weight of two students and then can complete one full lap in the school pool and they actually race their boats against each other in a time trial. So they spent, the students spent a month researching and building and designing these boats. It goes right along with our science and math standards that we're learning in class and it's coordinated with our curriculum map so that as the students, for example, are learning about forces and um, center of balance, they're building these boats as a project-based learning opportunity and it really gets at the heart of what STEM education could look like in a K-12 setting, that we're building actual authentic projects and being able to use them. Um, and we've had students who have come back from their college experience in engineering programs to say that they've had very similar projects that they've done in their engineering programs um, at the universities all around the state. Um, the last thing I wanted to leave you with today was to show you a little bit of the cardboard boat races. All right. And um, this set of footage that I have here for him to see if I can. So this uh, is actually footage from our last year. The, yesterday was the event, and our footage has not yet been processed for me to show you. Unfortunately, today I'll have that for you next month. But we have some really epic footage from last year's event that I thought I would show you. We had a group who made the USS Merrimack, and they completely mocked it up out of cardboard and duct tape, and this is their boat getting in the water. All right, let's get them in the water. Let's get them in. That's right. <laughs> Center of balance apparently wasn't a strong standard for their. their history, it's a history lesson. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it's a great event. It brings together the whole school. We have volunteer teams from our, our student groups 
Um, so we have a group that's a, a male leadership group called Brotherhood. They come and volunteer to remove and dispose of the boats. We have the lifeguards, our student volunteers. Um, we've had our, our student association who's come and helped us to organize the event. We have an MC who's a teacher or an administrator at our school. And it just it's a coordinated effort of, uh, that represents our whole school culture and brings everyone together in a way that makes academics much like sports. Okay. Um, at this time, I will open it up to any questions that you might have. Yeah, I had a okay. question about the okay, grants. Yeah. When you said for science and math teachers, does that te include elementary school teachers who teach science and math? So or is it just people who are already teach science and math teachers? Um, right now, it is focused at those who are specialized in the areas of math and science, which mostly targets the secondary level teachers. But the long-term plan is to provide, is to create a sustainable model where we can support teachers K-12 with math, science instruction. Oh, but our highest good. leverage area right now is to, to work with teachers who are specialized in math and science areas. Okay, because the elementary school teachers, I think a lot of them need a lot of help in how to teach mm -hmm. science and math. So and definitely an, an to area to, to definitely look for support. Okay, thanks. Sure. That sounds good. Are you fine? Your boat building exercise seems very consistent with what um, does it Next we can't gen. respond to yeah. presenters but what Mike I think was presenting about mm -hmm. the nature of the difference of what we're trying to do in teaching science under this next wave and traditional one. Is that is that consistent? I mean this was really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that consistent with what you see as some of the major changes in the delivery of of the discipline that need to be made and, and it looks like you're doing it. I'm just wondering if that picture is um, your picture as well. It, it definitely is. Um, I guess I would, I would make it, the, the clearest way I've been able to understand it is learning science by doing science is, is kind of the, the best practice, that, or the overarching best practice. That yes, it's true that many of these things have already been discovered, they've already been learned, the conclusions have been made, but if we put students in a position to experience it and to go through the motions of not necessarily discovering it, but constructing an understanding of how all the pieces go together through an authentic experience. We're finding, and there's research to show, that there's long-term retention, there's stronger conceptual understanding, and there's more reliable application of their learning to novel situations, whether that be a building or engineering setting or a more um, classic style of, of conceptual reasoning. But yes, that I would it say that's so very much consistent. more effective, inspiring, engaging than just fun. memorizing fun, you know, oh, yeah. memorizing these facts. So it was really, really helpful. Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. I, I did notice one thing, by the way. I can see now why the board, once in a while, you just dedicate your time, your servant leaders, you don't look for recognition. I guess it goes with the territory, because I'm on the board of CCSSO, and when we go to somewhere fancy, they take us, as I'm on the board, and we had our retreat last month, during an ice storm in DC. We also are the ones that sponsor the Teacher of the Year and pay for and they where do they go? Arizona, warm plenty <laughs> yeah. servant leadership, you know, we yeah. all yeah. there was a dust storm where he was. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, right. They did have to put the heaters on outside at night. Oh did they? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> no sympathy yeah, here. Everyone made fun of me for wearing short sleeves. It was Okay, well, we're going to move right to Marty and Cassandra. Marty, actually, and then Cassandra. I don't want to put her on the spot, but it turns out to be the Marty Cassandra show, and that's Everybody been great the last few months. So, <laughs> yeah, right. back by popular demand. Speaking of fun, speaking of having fun, here I am. <laughs> um, Wendy's over there, not smiling. <laughs> and uh, legislatively, um, the legislature's back from their holiday break, obviously, and the House Education Committee. Uh, continues hearings on the educator and administrative administrator evaluation bills, House Bills 52, 23, and 24. I have um, bill analyses done of both bills. We'll also send them to you electronically. Um, so it gives you an idea of what, of what is in the introduced version of the bills. They are still going through uh, testimony um, in the committees. Uh, the Senate and House Appropriations Subcommittees um, are having hearings on the Department of Education budget and the school aid budget concurrently. Just like last year, they both, instead of, in previous years, you'd have one house take care of the bill, pass it to the second house, and then they, they concur, not concur. 
this year, like last year, they're both doing it at the same time so that it speeds up the process. The, um, the bill to uh, codify the Education Achievement Authority sits on the House floor um, still. Uh, the Senate passed version. The House needs to either concur or non-concur and send it to a conference committee. There is no action on that bill um, to date, and we are not hearing anything as to the, um, the progress of that bill. And in the legislative committee meeting, I believe it was last week, um, that was discussed earlier today once when, when Mike showed his clip from his appearance on Off the Record, but also his interview on um, the Paul W. Smith show on WJR this morning, the, a big, a lot of attention is <coughs> coming on snow days. And so at the legislative committee meeting last week, early last week, a bill had not been introduced yet, but one has since been introduced, House Bill 5285, um, to allow schools to make up those additional days. Every, as Mike mentioned this morning, I think, every school gets six days of snow days or, or days that are closed out of their control, be it you know, outbreak of illnesses or utilities go out or something like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so once they get beyond the six days, then they have to make up, they have to replace those days or replace that time. So the, the House Bill 50, uh, 5285 has been introduced to allow schools to make up those that time in minutes as opposed to days. And so Cassandra um, had been working on a, a statement for the state board to encourage one direction. Well, um as Marty said, the, this bill was not introduced as of the time that we had our legislative committee meeting. So the statement that I'm passing out, which I did not draft, I'm just going to say that, um, just so there's no confusion. But this was not approved by the legislative committee because we had decided to wait until actual legislation had been proposed before we would even consider any type of statement um, rather than be preemptive and assume things that might not be true. So what I'm going to pass out to you is a draft statement um, that addresses this particular legislation. And there was a request made that we consider um, a statement that indicates that we support days as opposed to minutes um, for the reasons being that um, for basically student um, instruction that uh, days are more important, that it allows teachers to actually fulfill their, um, their lesson plans as opposed to trying to make that up with various minutes. Um, and that, uh, Eileen has pointed out, research indicates is a much stronger um, quality for the student. So this is a proposed statement. Uh, again, I just want to reiterate, the Legislative Committee did not vote on this, so you know, this is open, completely open for discussion at the board table. Um, do you want me to read this or? Okay. Uh, so the statement is as follows. The State Board of Education's stated mission is that all students graduate ready for careers, college, and community. The State Board firmly believes that students should receive the maximum amount of quality educational instruction possible in order to meet that goal. Current state law requires school districts to offer at least 1,098 hours of instruction in the 2013-14 school year. The districts must also provide a minimum of 170 days or the number of days offered in 2009-10, whichever is greater. Many districts provide 180 days of instruction, and some districts provide even more. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I didn't think you needed to read it all. Do you think you need oh, to read it all? Oh, I thought you sorry. told me no, to. No, no, I'm oh. sorry. I'm sorry. I was saying no. I think we can all read. The oh, thank you. No. So, yeah. Then I don't need to read this. Right. So, I, but I will. Um, I will move uh, support for this statement. So moved by John. Supported by okay. Eileen. Oh, okay. Will you go, go ahead. Go ahead. Just for discussion. Let's yeah. have. Yeah. We're going to second it for the purposes of discussion. Right. right. As we always do. So moved by. John, supported by Eileen. Purpose of the discussion, who would like to? Eileen and Lupe? The alternative could be that they add 20 days of school and then cancel any days they don't use up for additional snow days. There and I, 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 I truly, we've been uh, uh, communicating on this, and at first it seemed like it wouldn't be that big a deal. Um, and then I started thinking about all of the kids and all the research that we have that shows that just simply being there day after day is more 
valuable than being a tired child who's having an extra half an hour tacked onto their day, which I gather it is. It's a minimum of a half an hour. Um, I, I'm torn because I truly understand. I tried to check and see what the snow day level had been for northern Michigan, for example, for uh, uh, Senator Potvin's district or Traverse City or the Upper Peninsula, and I know it's been brutal out there. But, um, and, and this is not the easiest to believe in research, if you know what I mean. It's not, it's not really compelling research, but my understanding is that simply being in school more days is associated with learning achievement that may not be there if it's additional minutes to the day. If we know that, then including it in here would be great. Um, if we don't, then I still think this is the better strategy. Thank you. Lupe, please. Okay. Uh, what, what is the number of days over the top? Like, let's say they're allotted up to six days, and then after the, the seventh day, then they have to make it up. What is that number? Six. six. six they days. get six okay. freebies. So already. the seventh day and up, they have to make it up. All right. Well, I, I did a little research with GRPS, mm -hmm. and what they told me is that in, in they, they're not over the top yet. Oh, really? So they don't have to make up anything as of yet. But, however, they said that they would rather add minutes to the day versus days to the year because it's less expensive uh, to to retain the students in in the buildings and like get it over with then adding <laughs> days to the to the yeah to yeah 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 to the year the money. Uh, because of the expense uh, so that's one and then my other view is why don't they allow the school districts to determine which is a better situation for them minutes or Days. Why well, is it going to be a law? I do think, uh, I mean, I, the board needs to do what the board's going to do, but I'm on record that after April 1, if there's more days, I can waive them. And I didn't two years ago. I don't plan to. I think it's kind of, it's opposite of what our mission is here. Um, not demeaning politicians, but they're getting pressure in other ways. I really give credit to, I mean, there's a couple right in this area, and I think they're all over this state, where boards and districts are stepping up and, and even without this law are saying we're putting the days back. They're giving up their, their spring break. They're giving up. They're heading to the end of the year. And this really puts them at, in an awkward spot. I, I don't know if this was in this meeting or if it was on the interview just before this meeting, but I said today what I really believe. Superintendents get fired on snow days and, and where your bus stops are, much more than they do on are your kids reading. So they're really out. Dietrich at St. John's, new superintendent, I give him a lot of credit for saying, no, we have to make up the days. We can't do what we have to do. My own daughter as a teacher is freaking out because she's saying, I don't know how to get this aligned when I miss this many days for the way I have my instruction planned. I need at least 180 to get, you know, the way I've got this laid out. And then once you start, and as it is, you're already going to get six off. You know, any, mo right. most school, I didn't realize. Anyway. So, so they're already getting, you know, um, I don't want to say a free pass. That would be unfair. I mean, everyone works very hard at this. This is not to say anything like that. It's just I think there is clear evidence that <coughs> these countries in particular that do 200 and 220 days that just consistently are, are achieving better than we are. And to just see a chip away where if I had my way, I don't have it, and, and we don't even have it together, but I'm not sure I would even do the six freebies. We, when I was a local <coughs> superintendent, we had to make them all up. Yes, ma'am. I, I just want to point out that the way this statement is written, it doesn't specifically say we oppose this legislation or we, you know, all it says is we believe the better alternative is to add days. So I just want to make that, yeah. that clear, that this is not necessarily us telling the legislature vote no on this. This is just us saying... From our experience and our professional, uh, you know, beliefs, this is the better way to go. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. So then, uh, and so then, they don't really have to add days to the end of the year. They can slice them off some of the vacations. That's what St. John's is doing, for example. Yeah. They're, they're, so there's and then different what, ways that they could accomplish what they have to I don't know if you remember this. I know Kath, John, some of us in that era that if anything we were headed, we'd gotten to 190, and and there was and it was when there was some money, so we we're actually getting more money as locals in order to be able to keep ratcheting the days up. And then when that all fell apart, 
you traded off the days because the money went. That whole graph we saw go down, the trade-off was the legislature brought the requirements down. It had been, the goal was to get to 200. And we, I think we got to 190 something, if I'm not remember, if I'm remembering correctly. And then, it, and appropriately, in a way, it's like people were being asked to work an extra month from 180. I mean, an extra 20 days. So there was a compensation issue, which was appropriate. And then that just derailed. So I, I mean, I think that's a fair way to approach this, which is it's the pre preference without necessarily, right. you know, proposing as a. Well, sorry, if I yes, ma'am. No, please. Um, so should we add that? The suggestion that they um, that they do it during a break as opposed to the end of the year, or um, I mean, if you're asking, my opinion would yeah. be the local could determine that whether they wanted to add or do the break. Yeah, but we could suggest, you know, considering the options or something like that, because that's as I said, I know they did. I know PW where Mertz lives, they took that on. And, and it's rocky because it's, you have two sides. It's almost like calling a snow day. It's why I eventually moved out, took the kids out of being, being kids and where I was superintendent because we'd start getting calls 3 o'clock the day before. Is your dad going to call a snow day? And what a moron. <laughs> he didn't call a snow day. He's the it's worst guy up, in the world. Right? If you don't get 70% or what is it, the number? 75%, 75 uh, then you can't even count it as a day. Right. You know, so if it's a bad day and you don't call it, then you're all absolutely okay. right. I mean, you're you're mm -hmm. you, you are you're between. But th th as I said back, right. you can tell I'm old. I'm talking about back in the day. But back in the day, you had to <laughs> you had to get at least 180, then 185. So you would build in an extra week to be safe. Right. And then you would kind of like someone. I guess it was Eileen suggested you would you would ratchet it back. And it, it feels different if you say at the end of the year we're closing five days earlier because we didn't have the snow days. That right. at least teachers could still plan on. I'm going to have the 180 days, and in this case, a lot of them do, as the resolution suggests. But some are down to 170, and then with the free B six days, they'd be down to 164. Yes, ma'am. And then yes, ma'am. Oh, is it me? Yes, Kath. Me? It's you. Oh, thank you. If we, if we do this, I just, I just wonder, uh, and I lost my train of thought, but my feeling is that adding the 30 minutes at the end of the day or 30 minutes during somehow or other lengthening each class by five minutes or 10 minutes, it's not going to do a thing. And I think that if we add days at the end of the year or the ho reducing holidays, people are going to be resentful too. So I think we ought to do the one that we think is better, and I think the one that we, I think is better is the adding the days, because I think the minutes don't really mean very much. It right. ends up with just nothing, I think. Right. Might as well not do so it. So I, I would I would support the statement. I just Thank you. Know, the, the districts are going to they're all going to be bad about something. <laughs> <laughs> that the is students and that the is our are world. Going to resent <laughs> they're going to think they got rejected somehow. Yeah. yeah. Well, it does cost more. Yeah, I don't know. I would. I would and on language. Uh, I would in the third paragraph down legislation, and then I would. Um, uh, in, the, in the third line of the third paragraph, I would say comma, as opposed to making them up with full days of, inst uh, see, wait a minute, wait, I wanted to, I'm sorry. Uh, legislation has been introduced to allow school districts to make up those additional days beyond the six allowed by adding minutes onto each day remaining on their school calendars. A better solution would be to make them up with full days of student instruction, which allows teachers to implement their full instructional plan for the school year or schools to uh, implement their full instructional plan for the school year. Don't so you say take teachers. The, take it out of the last paragraph Sorry. and put it in the, the first, that paragraph. Well, okay, I, I, it's the, oh, I'm gosh, I'll be darned, you put that in there. Okay, no right. wonder it's not a familiar. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I would put it in earlier I, because I think that I would just offer that, the whole alternative in that one paragraph. Well, I don't know. Well, sorry about sorry, that. Lost. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Don't paragraph. stay lost. We got it in. Yeah. There. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It can. It kind of culminates with. Yeah. The no, I didn't mean to lift it. I meant to add it. I didn't realize it was down the last cool. paragraph. Now. So. Dan. 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 And John. Uh, so I love the last paragraph. I think mean, it's the longest yep. in here. Um, I, the one thing that I might want to see added is just a statement that, like, the, the state board of education strongly encourages. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't think it's. It's not clear who the audience is for this. I think we should just say, like, we strongly encourage districts, you know, but whoever the audience is, like, okay. we're talking to you. 
Yeah, because districts can do this on their own no matter what the law said. That's why St. John's and others are stepping up on their own, and then they've decided they're not making it up in minutes even if the law permitted them to. So that's a good point. I mean, we're encouraging them to do it that way because they don't, the law doesn't require them to do it with minutes even if it went through. Got that, Marty? I got it. Yes, ma'am. Kath, please. If we make issue this statement, presumably the department will testify based on this. Yes. So it's just as if we took a position. Um, this is a position. Well, Realistically, Mike has already taken the position, right? Because publicly you mentioned this at, was it the Scubic? Yep. I have, but, yeah. you know, you're, you're welcome to be different, obviously. Yeah. I, I, so I had should, to. Are we supposed be... to be influencing the department's policy? What's that? I, I'm just confused. I thought the role of the board was to influence the department policy, not to have a separate no. one. But maybe that's not true. Well, the role of well, the, the board is to influence the department. Would, uh, have an issue well, with the board is to set the policy, <laughs> and the staff, the department, supposed to implement it. Okay. But I think so we, we should be continuing seconds? to do what we think is encourage <laughs> the right outcome. And in this case, I totally agree with yeah. Kath. I think and Mike, you know, giving minutes is advocating on mm -hmm. kids learning, whereas replacing it with some days of instruction, however gained, is a chance to um, have real learning continue. So. I think we should, uh, as amended, um, endorse this resolution and encourage okay. uh, yeah. districts and the legislature, if they should act, to follow. I just have one further comment. Yes, I just sir. want to get in. Is um, when people talk about what they do in other countries. I know in Finland they have like 75 minutes a day of free time recess, and their days are shorter than ours. So there's also something to be said about giving kids some free time away from. You know, an, an unstructured time to play as well. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, just when I'm asked an opinion, I'm only giving my opinion as a state soup, and I'm often put on that spot, and the board's yeah. been good about that, and I normally have a pretty good sense that, you know, am I getting into something that's going to be complicated? Um, but, I mean, you know, had this not taken this course, obviously that would be the board's. I'd respect it. We would testify along those lines no matter what you say. But I, I just the nature of the job is you're, like in that case, I mean, what do you think about that? And I do think as an educator that that's not the way to go. But and it sounds like Kathy and others here feel the same way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just add minutes, I mean. Right. I think that makes sense. Okay. But, I, but we probably should call the vote then? Yep. Mm -hmm. So all in favor of the resolution, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great. Thank you very much. Um, is what you thought, Gary. Is that it, Marty? I was just going to say, I think this is that what you're doing is great. It does to be able to have a full day or a full instructional set block of time is way better than additional minutes. And I look at it from the flip side when we have half days or non full days, it's much more frustrating to try to do something in a, a shortened amount of time, minutes wise, than it is to not have that day at all. So I think that what you're doing is going to be really great in the, in the best benefit of student learning. Yep. Good. Thank you, John. Yeah. Not that I'm the. You don't, you don't want to schedule the extra 20 days. Now. What's that? You don't want to schedule the extra 20 days and then cancel them. John and Ken. Um, we've taken positions on the support for the implementation of the evaluation feature, evaluation recommendations, and on the thoughtful, effective choices for turnaround schools and on um, an improved in the third grade reading demand scenario. Um, is there anything else we can do to encourage good legislation towards those um, targets on those three pieces as we speak? But I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused on where the turn, you know, where the uh, choice option stuff is between House and Senate. I'm seeing good public support for the teacher evaluation stuff, but I'm also hearing that there's a lot of opposition to it still on both sides. And third grade reading sounds like we have a little more time to worry about the, the, the right response to that or, or um, torquing of that legislation. Well, the, we did discuss the teacher evaluation bills, and um, this board had previously approved language that said that we supported approval of the MCE report as a whole, mm -hmm. that it should not be broken down and piecemealed back together. And the legislation as proposed um, seems to do some of that, 
And so um, I believe the Wendy um, and Marty were working on a document that would show kind of the difference between the report versus the legislation, correct? And that we should see that um, soon? We have something along that line. Okay, yes, and so when, when well, we, I mean, clearly that will be shared with the board, but our next um, legislative meeting is March 6th, which may, I don't know, you know, timeline what that means, if that's too late, but um, we can certainly kind of address that piece. Well, we just don't know yet. Yeah. Whether but, there's anything collectively or individually we can do for advocacy on the, the best possible version of that legislation and other pieces. I think once we have that document, that will yeah. shed a lot of light on what we need to do, so. Yes, sir. It was Kathleen, then Richard, I think. Oh, okay. Well, uh, was this about the evaluation bill? Uh, I have something else. Okay, so please. Okay, I'm just uh, veering off into another broader <laughs> topic myself. <laughs> um, but <laughs> my, no, no, not there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when, I, when I testified before the committee, I went first, so I had absolutely no idea what I was saying. And um, <laughs> had, I, had I had it to do over again, I would have stressed the coherence of the Smarter Balance uh, with its intent of measuring against the curriculum, um, holding teachers responsible uh, for growth, uh, feedback on individual students. There's a coherence there which was lost in all the subsequent testimony. I wish I had brought that out further. And I think that is the chief my chief concern as the legislature picks apart some of our, our recommendations, some of the M MDE's recommendations, is once you've got a you know, once you've engineered a car to, to work together, to have someone re-engineer this part or that part can be, can be fatal to the whole design. That's good so point. if we have some means, uh, of, and not to put more work on, on your poor MDE staffers here, but, but some means of maybe a, coming up with a schematic or something that will uh, help, help us place the parts in the, in the overall scheme. I remember the one, the one representative, I think it was, uh, uh, who kept saying that, you know, we didn't get good bids on, on our test. And it's like, it's like you know, I've had, I've had the one company build me a kitchen uh, to spec, and then am I going to go out and get other bids from other companies? It just, you know, just doesn't work that way. But I, I didn't, well, he didn't, he didn't pause for me to answer the question, yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> And the chairman apparently didn't expect anyone to answer his question either because he went on to the next questioner. But it may not have been a question. Yeah. I, well, yeah. I, I certainly got that impression, yeah. Because on, on the bid, if I may say, yeah. this is a little bit of a point of, that we're, you know, tense about or, or the way some have pitched this is ACT, by its own declaration, said we don't have a product to bid when this was bid out exactly. last time. Exactly. So yeah. that's the way that was. Now, apparently they do and would in December. December's less than a year away, so bid on it then. But we've already got a three-year plan that's going to culminate with the spring of 15 that was this whole initial plan, as you say. It, it's a good image of, like, the car and suddenly you want to pull out the transmission. Well, you know, how are we going to refit all that in time if it turned out that this other bid... You know, in fairness to ACT, they, now they realize the Common Core actually became a reality. They may be at that point where, I don't know, but we're betting on that wasn't going to happen, so why develop all these products? Now they are developing the products that will align, and they'll probably have a good and meaningful bid then, and then so be it. You know, but it, it's caused a lot of confusion because it almost sounds like bad bid. They didn't bid at all. Right. And then we always, we're subject to DTMB. We don't make these decisions anyway, the way state government works. So, the, you know, the Department of Budget actually awards this in the final analysis. I mean, we have to support it and defend it and, and justify why we're going in a certain direction, but they can and have, could overrule it. So I, I, that's one point of misinformation. And then the other part is just, as I said earlier, that we're still going to have the college entrance exam, as people think about it, which is the ACT. Yeah. And when I heard some were worried that, well, will that go away? Not unless the colleges change overnight and say, oh, we're willing to take something different. I don't see that happening. And, and so it's just, it's almost a non-issue. It's just made an issue from those that want to, and as I said, I think, I think we're in a, um, 
in a thoughtful position to say the next time the bids are, fine. If that goes another way, great. They just didn't have a product at the time, and we've had a three-year plan on this, and we're ready to you know, take us to the end of that plan. Yes, ma'am. Well, it was Kathy first. I'm sorry. And then Eileen. Uh, you said something earlier in the op when you opened the meeting today that it doesn't make sense to cut taxes at this point. I agree. And I, I think that we, uh, we should make a statement regarding the, what to do with the surplus. And I think we should say that we should restore, we should restore as far as possible funding for educate for K-12, pre-K-12. Well, pre-K is doing okay. K-12 uh, and, uh, and maybe local units, of, or local units of government, including so we get support from the municipal league and other people. Uh, because local units of government, including school districts, were really hurt by the cuts and, and their suffering. The local units of government, the cities, the villages, townships are suffering. And the residents are suffering because of the lack of services. And the same is true with schools. So I would like to see us make a statement of, to that effect uh, that rather than reduce taxes, and we can say that taxes have been reduced so much that we have nine and a half percent to go, whatever, whatever it is to get to get to the Headley Amendment limit. We we have a lot of room there. Uh, so I would propose that we make a statement to that effect. Do you want to move that for discussion, or do you want to kind of so, okay, I so move, move. move by Kathleen support? I, I move that we we propose. No, rather than reducing taxes, that we or restore rebate. funding to local units of government and school districts. I support. I'm supported yep. by Cassandra. People support. Mm -hmm. so, so further discussion. I would only. I said if they're going to cut something or going to restore something, it should be the earned income tax credit, as was suggested by our speakers, um, and perhaps the uh, retiree pension. <laughs> pension tax. Well, you're losing me on that, but I, I think, and I, I don't know how, can we agree on a s sort of language of a statement that is consistent with the general proposition, which I very much support, that given the historic um, disinvestments, as we mm -hmm. saw today, in Right, we can, we can doctor up the language, make it public stronger. Public service, public goods. Well, Maybe um, I, I can amend the motion slightly just to say that the board would like the legislative committee to come up with a statement and then come back for discussion. Would that make sense? Yeah. I guess we have time. They may be moving is the only passing. thing. You never can tell what I think this it, yeah. I think yeah. maybe both. Maybe if the spirit of it is today in case they move between now and March. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then a more, you know, an additional uh, context if, if if needed for the, yes, please. I would just be very careful given the student drop, the student count drop. What you don't want to get into if you're asking for that is um, political rejection of verbiage because what you're really asking for is increased funding for education. I'm certainly always open to asking for that, um, but given the student count drop over the last little bit, one of the things that definitely wasn't part of the discussion this morning, but it's huge. And we know that the, um, the amount of, of funding can't sustain the system the way it is. We know that classrooms could use more money. I'm okay asking for that, but I wouldn't use the word restore. I would say increase. And then it's um, not a political argument. It's an argument on the merits of whether or not we should be funding more in education, which the governor has proposed in the foundation grant. Why, why don't, why don't <coughs> the legislative committee fashion a statement and send it around before the next meeting. Mark, Mike's worried that they may act. Well, I can't imagine that they're, they're going to act on the budget that fast, no matter what. Oh, yeah, March. that's right. No, thank you. That's right. So, and it could follow the contours of, given the, yeah. um, we, Stay we, away but from we prefer them. investing in Michigan's people and anything else you want to throw in versus cutting taxes gives okay. a surplus, period. Yeah, I stand corrected. That's right. Yeah. It's not going to move till the budget moves. So you would oppose the earning of tax credit? No, I like the earning of income tax credit. I just, if we start adding a variety of policy moves, I, got, yeah, I actually it's... think we should be taxing well-off pensioners to pay for things like education. Okay. Right. It's a graduated tax. I think you want to stay away from us being that's, making you know, specific that's... recommendations on the taxes definitely. in the middle of the budget cycle. I, I think we're just saying that just education saying could use more money. We should put the money into service 
putting money back into services. Yeah. I thought it was one of the recommendations of yeah. our speakers was to, for educational purposes, to improve education, is to restore the earned income tax credit. So I think there's a link to education. But. Yeah, what I found a couple of these awkward situations I was in with the media the last couple of weeks was just because you're clarifying issues related to, let's say, pension versus which way you put it, doesn't mean that one does, at least I'm speaking for myself, doesn't think we don't need more resources. I think right. we do. I, I would go with what John said earlier today in a different, in, I think in a different way, you know, you can, tar you can target these things and maybe, maybe it isn't even across the board because of different conditions that different students face. I mean, that's a whole other, that's more complicated than this statement, but, but you, right, right, right. But I just meant in the spirit that, you know, there's always a place that you could find to make this investment. And I think you get wide agreement. Um, Cause for one, if I just may say that it will come up probably over the next few months, but as the two props were talking today, you know, I, I think there's a role for the board to contribute to the discussion about what at-risk money would be used for. Because one of the problems, when Craig brings up that there's large expenditures in some of these districts that didn't get the results, sometimes it's because they're not using the at-risk money as an example the way we might help guide them to use the at-risk money. And even though we're not the legislature, maybe they would let, you know, so in other words, you just can't use it on, in theory, it's a little bit targeted, but in reality, it's used as a backfill often. Mm. So, so you meant it to be for specific reasons, almost like state title money, if you want to think of it that way. And it might be a roll down the road as the board develops these positions that, you know, you're targeting money to at risk because that's where the needs are most. But here's, here's what works best. You know, so use the money for kids in poverty. When we find out if you use it for these two things, it really has great power. If you put it over here, not so much. It's community and schools. <clears throat> right, there's, that's a great example. I mean, that's a relatively modest investment. Because I, I was thinking today, if I was a local soup again, for every $200 or whatever you invest in the child, if I heard that right, um, you maybe get seven or 8000 back if you keep them in school for another year. That's a pretty good, even in their world, return on investment. You know, and even if you don't hit, get all of them, you probably, it probably sounds like they're getting up to half the kids they invest in. So a $200 investment, you're keeping them in school another year. It should be for the right reason, keep them in school so that they're actually going to have a future. But coincidentally, when you keep them in school, you're getting another year's foundation money. So, I mean, there's no, no downside there. Okay. We, yeah, yes, ma'am. If we're still on this, then I should wait. Okay. But I wanted to talk, I wanted to go back to Smarter Balanced and um, the teacher evaluation component. I think the thing that I heard after they tortured Richard Wednesday. There's a motion on the floor. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Oh, you're right. Yep. Order, um, order. We haven't voted on Kathy's. Yeah. No. Um, in my second. And is it right now that it's being referred to the legislative committee, no, or is yet. it amended, no, or? No, it hasn't been amended. No, we have a. We have the amendment. Let's. <laughs> what was the amendment? Did, did you accept her? <laughs> to, to have the, to request the legislative committee. To did you accept her for any amendment? No, she I did not. I thought we should vote on it today, but if, 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 I don't know if we have the votes to vote on it today. So well, why don't we if call we the vote. Matter, we have to finish the. We call the vote. Can I? Yes, sir. Uh, substitute motion that we refer to the legislative committee. Is there a second? Support. Can you do that? Yes, you can. You can so now, <laughs> so now <laughs> we vote on that. <laughs> we like enough to do that. So now we vote on that to see right. whether there's yeah, enough votes to refer to the. Can we discuss the substitute motion? Yeah, let's yep. discuss that. So I, I, I don't think we have the exact language yet that everybody can agree on. Otherwise, yeah. I'm going to vote on it. Okay. I'm yeah. willing to go to the legislature. It's not going to. They're not going to vote out of the legislature. I don't think they're going to report it out of the Senate Education Committee and the Senate Finance Committee. And, sure. I, and I misspoke earlier because they're right. It really wouldn't be before next month anyway because it's part of the budget. Okay. So given, from my point of view, given we don't have the language exactly right, um, I will support giving it to the legislative committee for that one. Any okay, further discussion? The, uh, <laughs> okay. So we don't have to go through that now? <laughs> right. Okay. Can we still vote on Richard's? Amendment? Let's vote on Richard's just to <laughs> see. I'm curious all about right. it. So <laughs> let's vote on Richard's. It was a substitute motion. So all in favor of the <laughs> substitute motion. All in favor of the substitute motion. 
No. Kathy. All in favor of the substitute <laughs> motion to refer to the committee? Aye. 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 Opposed, same? Aye. What? I just want to vote against Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want people to think I'm getting too cozy with Richard. <laughs> and I'm going to support the, I'm going to vote for the amended Kathy motion that's coming up next. Oh. <laughs> Yes, let's start over again. <laughs> Wipe out this whole this no, let's start over. Please. It's the same. That was voted. The end result's the same. That was voted, voted, voted down. down. That was voted down. But the record shows. That was voted fiercely, in, no. which yeah. means oh, it's referred to the <laughs> legislative committee. Fiercely opposed That's Richard's it. motion. That's it. It was voted. <laughs> even in spite of John wanting to go the other way, it's already resolved. It's going to the legislative committee. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. How about consent agenda? I move support. Supported by John. I mean, moved by John, supported by Dan. You can get payback. Uh, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. <laughs> Any comments from board members? In seriousness, that I wanted to thank Richard for testifying. <coughs> thank you. Those are not easy. I wouldn't I have move a on. I have yes, ma'am. A couple of things. One was. Um, uh, <clears throat> report back on the um, the changes to the special ed codes. Um, I don't know changes to what? The, the special ed regulations and what oh. was you know sort of happening with that because I'm getting sort of mixed reports from people who are telling me it's it's significant and others are saying it's just cleaning up. Um, so I just wanted to at some point doesn't have to be today. Well, two things. One are the the rules are going out for public um, comment. Comment, and then there'll be two hearings. One's in Detroit, and one is okay. Lansing. I think okay. so. There's plenty. We're okay. way ahead of the curve here, and people and, and folks that write you that are interested in that, I'd refer them to either the hearings or okay. to the online. But will we get a report here at the board? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, thank you. And yeah. the other issue I had is in one in your memo, you mentioned something about severing an agreement with regard to the EAA, and I I'm, I was curious to know. Um, what the status of that was, and if there was a new agreement that was going to be um, reinstituted, and what that would be. Well, that, that was my first item under my report, and I probably no, it was wasn't as clear as it uh, could oh, have been. Me. No, it, it, the reason the complication is I thought it would be as easy as just changing an exclusivity paragraph in there so that we would have other options. It turns out there's, it, you know, I, I had to, we had to even revisit this. It's like, so where were we when? Well, we were. We were at a point where we had what I still call the grand home law, even before Snyder was around, and we were trying to figure out how do you operate this. And that's when the conception of another entity, we didn't know it would be the EAA, we didn't know there'd be names that are now more controversial and stuff, we just knew there'd be another entity. So what happened at that time was, well, there, there was no reason not to have an agreement with this other entity that would actually operate the schools that were in the state reform district. Now that we've evolved and you see a lot of the other, you know, we learned through this, you're, and, and clear to me, we need other options. Um, that's when we said, how do we do that? Part of it's the law, but we suddenly kind of tripped on it. Well, geez, even if the law changes, I need to get that contract changed. So that's what we're in the process of doing. And the reason it, it sounded more severe when you say, when you say, when I said also sever, because the only way you can do, the, get out of the exclusivity is to sever it. But it's not, be, we don't want to send the wrong message there. It's not because we don't think there's a place that there may be for schools in the future. But, um, so the AG's office doesn't have an opinion yet? Or no, they, 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 we asked them to give us a contract. We signed it. I sent it there. and expecting it to come back in the next couple Can of days. Can we have access to what that is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what it, what it is is it's canceling that contract, but I, I'm just putting a little more wordage, verbiage in here because canceling it doesn't mean that we couldn't use them as an option just like we would a local district or an ISD. Okay. So I'm just trying to get some clarity because I have lots of people right. asking me for well, They should be, for different reasons maybe, they should be good with that, that it's not exclusive. And as I said, if you look at the history, because as we were even revisiting this and we're thinking, oh, I don't you look at the date when we did this, this was in a notion that we just, you couldn't imagine. Oh, what, we knew we weren't going to operate it here. Yeah. You know, you can't operate it on. I actually looked at the clip when it was first, the idea was first introduced and it sort of was, uh, helped me to understand, you know, it was before much was known about the organization. Right. right. And it was in good, I mean, it's, it's still in good faith. Yeah. I mean, this was institutions getting together. Um, I still think the better way, rather than have, 
Eastern and all these other kind of agreements would be to have law that makes clear what options are, and hopefully there are many. And, you know, if it sounds like it's going to be perhaps the way that <coughs> people are talking about it, that there may be a delay that wouldn't allow that for a while, that we can live with that. I mean, we've gone 40 years. It's not like we <coughs> – but I, but I do think people would agree that the, what we're looking at out of 4,000 schools, the – very small number on a relative basis, the 10 or 15, whatever it is, they're, they're just, you'll, you'll have clarity about that if and, if and when we get to that point about what, why we think those are, look, need another chance somewhere else. And as I said, that may very well be a school district next door that's actually done it already with a very, very similar school district. But, um, but I, I just acknowledge, I mean, we were even trying to reconstruct ourselves. And I, what was it that, you know, because forget where you were at that point in time. And one downside, I remember then later having a conversation with Governor Granholm and Dylan, who were both kind of, that, that was their baby at the time, was the one hesitation we had is, okay, that sounds good, but you can't just stick it in a department. We don't, I don't have an infrastructure to run schools here. And then, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> well, I hope they still get to that. You know, it's, and then it would, I think the other thing you would have, if you could use, uh, you know, have another, a number of options, is there'd be more confidence that your schools would be back. Because that has to be in the law. We need clarity. That's one thing that got left out of this original law and that I know the board took up in its, appropriately in its resolution was, okay, that's great. Now what do we do? What are the circumstances under which it goes back to a district? which has to be clear and not somehow limbo for forever. So more to come on that, but thank you. That's what that was what that was about. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I, I just want to say thank you to everyone around the table and over here around the room for their support and, and uh, the vote of confidence in the Cesar e. Chavez resolution. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do to get it out there. And also, thank you for the hearty, hearty conversation we had around the lunch table. I appreciate that, too. Mm -hmm. And for thank the public, you. no mystery. It was more about getting them moving on time, moving the, <laughs> moving the ball, <laughs> tell, telling the chair that he should gong people more often. Made. So so don't take that and as I'm off to Puerto Rico. No, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm cutting you off. <laughs> <laughs> Is that today? This so you're heading out today? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow morning. Good luck with that. Morning. By this time tomorrow, God willing, estoy en Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs>